and welcome back to the woods here at River Run. We're going to do another um, uh, painting here of, of the beautiful river. Um, I'm sorry the light isn't quite so great, but the wet, bad weather's rolling in, so we figured we'd better get on and do it. So, uh, I think you can see from the scene camera, we have uh, a lovely piece of tree that fell down. Fell down a wee while ago, um, but um, I've been planning to paint it ever since. So. First, first job is to get down on the canvas while we've got good weather, um, the view. So first step is drawing the composition. So here we go. The biggest shapes first. So the big shape is this big sweeping tree. Now I'm going to, I'm going to draw a slightly different angle than the, tree, than the, than the camera sees, because obviously we have to have different cameras and in different places to do this. So there's a little bit more of a twist on um, the uh, view that I've got than the view of the camera. So, so what we're doing is establishing the bigger shapes first. So I begin with quite a light mark so that I um, have an opportunity to change my mind if I want to. So the main view is this big tree, another tree behind, um, another tree sweeping up, sweeping up here. And then of course we've got the, uh, the tree with the fallen branch, which comes up and over. Now to get the fallen branch bit, I have to be quite careful with my shape. So I'm just gonna rough that in and, uh, and then uh, look back at it afterwards. So I want to get that lovely twist now there was more foliage on it, obviously when it came down, so I'm going to remember all that foliage. And, um, and then we need to, to frame it where it's sitting on the uh, landscape. So we have the other side of the river. Now there's a whole mass of trees on the other side of the river. That's a good way of getting a straight line, by the way, using the long side of the chalk. Um, so I'm just picking out a few. Now the river is very low at the moment, so the bank actually gives rather a nice drop there and I can um, put in uh, the roots um, afterwards. And then we have this big shelf of rock, which again is uh, somewhat unusual. Uh, the, the river this year has been the lowest ever, um, and well, at least ever since I, I saw it. Uh, we moved here in 95, so that's a good, good while. Now, then there's a lovely path that goes twisting off through the woods. So we want to get that winding back when the sun comes across here. So hopefully we're going to get another day down here where we can um, put the chiaroscuro, the light and shade through, because the sun filters through these trees and just makes everything come alive. So that may be hard for you to see um, in this uh, light. I, I know my son um, has walked this frequently with me and I'd always point out this view. And um, as he was setting up, the light came out and he said, oh God, it's so beautiful. And before that, he just couldn't see what it was that I was going to paint. So um, that's why I'm explaining to you what I'm seeing, give you a little bit more of an idea. Now that I've got the basic shapes, so there's a twist and, a, and a, basically what we have to do is to, is to cut this canvas up into smaller shapes each shape being different to add to the interest and each shape adding to the whole. So now that I've got the rough shapes in, I'm going to um, make them a little bit more firm. So as this branch comes down, there's, um, there's a characteristic twist to it. There's a little uh, wider bit here and then it turns slightly. That was my son nearly falling off the tree <laughs> as he takes scene photographs for you. He's dedicated. Okay, and then there's this second fallen tree which cuts across that one behind. And it has a lovely twist to it as well. And the two twists make for an interesting negative shape. So the negative shape is this space here which is in between. So when you're, when, you're, when you're placing all your positive shapes, you always want to look for, um, Donovan, you might just tighten that nut. That's gonna 
drive me nuts as, as we, you want your easel securely um, um, sorted because if it keeps shifting around on you while you're painting it gives a it gives a insecure feeling to you so you want to be able to be able to, to press in quite strongly and be definite with your shapes also if the wind comes along I don't think it will today it's um, it's a uh, it's a still day at least and we're quite sheltered in the woods but if the wind comes along what you do is is the little hook that's on your easel back here you hang a bag with stones or something there's usually stones around in in, in Ireland um, certainly by the river there always is um, so it saves you having to carry them to the site so I'm just um, marking that so as I'm painting I remember that's a, a quite different tree so that that's the one behind and it also helps me to isolate that shape uh, on the on the canvas so you can see now this divides the canvas not quite in two so if it were to have come across like this that would be bad composition because then you'd have two equal halves and your eye wouldn't know which to look at so you want to make it quite plain which to look at and if you were to imagine cutting that shape out with a pair of scissors and taking that like a like Matisse did in his later life when he would cut out his his, his um, figures with colored paper um, that shape in itself is a pleasing shape Zef, Zef. Um, sorry that's the dog um, and see this shape here is also a pleasing shape if you were to, to, to just cut that out and um, now we want to make this uh, uh, second branch on this, on this, um, which will come up like this. And this also wants to make a pleasing negative shape. So that negative shape there is different to that negative shape. You see, this one's slightly squarer. You see, it, um, the shape here is a little bit squarer. And here, it's slightly longer and thinner. So it makes a nice variety. Now, if we take this um, tree from the background here, I hope you can identify which one it is. Um, it sits up high on the bank. Now you see that shape there again makes a pleasing negative space. So this this shape here is quite different to this shape and it makes an interesting feel. Now I could subdivide this again with the extra little thinner twig that goes across there and it and do that. So that again makes even more interesting shapes and you see how it bisects this piece of land here so it doesn't run exactly along the edge so that you get another two interesting shapes now if i want to make more interesting shapes here we go we, we put in another tree here again with the steep drop and again you've cut cut it into more interesting shapes so um it helps it just helps with the um with the feel of, of, the, of, of the picture. Now, we want, um, we want how this sits into the river. So here uh, we have a bit of a turn of the river. Then we have the rocks that come out. And then um, that comes almost up to the tree, not quite, and then swings us back out again. But you know what? The bank really comes this way, and I think that would make a nicer shape if I have the bank coming this way. And then that's just a bit of stone. Okie dokie. Now, there's rather nice patterns in the water there, uh, which are uh, a little bit more obvious in, in, in daytime. Um, well, you know, it's evening time now, but um, I'm just going to mark slightly in what I can see with the ripples coming down the river. And if we get a, 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 a blast of sun at some point, I'm gonna mark those in a little bit more clearly. So the river comes up to here. Now, we have this big sweep which goes around here to the path. And, and then there's that silvery tree that the dog is lying beside. So we're going to get that. And you see it has a twist to it. it, it it's grown up not only with a curve like that, but it's got a curve that comes out towards you and goes back again, which makes it really very interesting. So here we have the curve and the way it sits, it slots into the ground there. It's quite interesting. And you see this bit is, is, is more bulging towards us. So we have this a little thicker and then it gets a little thinner as it goes away. So that gives the idea of the, the bulge, the twist. 
and then it comes up and it goes more or less straight out. Now, we want to make sure that the shape here between that and this twisting one is different. So that's a little difficult because this also bulges and twists. So, so we got, we got to um, be a little careful with that. So now you see, I'm making sure that there's a difference in the widths of these. I'm taking the zephyr back to the house. Are you? Okay. All right. Okay. That's fine, if you want. I don't mind, whichever you prefer. My son is going to take the dog and leave me with cameras rolling. Okay. So as long as this is different. He's happy there, Donovan. Why don't you leave him? It's okay. He's already been in shock for the beginning of it. No, he's fine. He'll lie, he'll lie down. I won't if he's tied up. It's fine. He's cool, he's in, in he's quiet. Okay. Fine. He seems to enjoy it, and I, I would let him enjoy himself. It's, he's cool, he's quiet, he's comfortable. Okay, so we have the um, next tree. Um, so this is the big sycamore coming across. Now, with the sycamore, we actually want to um, get in the foliage. We want to get the foliage in there. Well, maybe that hat's falling off. So I would um, just look to see the rough outline of the foliage. So. You, you want to make it cut this shape up into interesting shapes also. So here we go. Okay. And then we have another um, shape coming down here. Um, so I sit back quite a lot on my chair so that I get to see the, the view from a distance. If you're all the time um, close up to the view, it... Um, it means you're only seeing the small shapes. If you want to see the whole big shape, it's good to see the whole big shape. Now then. Now then. So we have another tree that comes up more or less like that. So that's making another nice um, pattern of, of different shapes. Now, uh, this shape here is slightly cutting the... It's not quite exactly even, but it, it's not particularly well placed. So what I can do is I can just change the angle of it a little bit. So I still have the feeling of what it is here in the woods, but without, um, without any of my shapes being repetitive. It, it's really, it adds to the strength of the, the design, the more different shapes you can conceive. Um, so it's using, using the woodland as a basis for your inspiration. Um, and then um, looking within that woodland for shape. Now, again, uh, we've got foliage that drapes across here, so we can look at putting that in. Now, I think, uh, think probably we could put this in a little more firmly. Yeah, I think I like that shape. So here we go. So it's taking what you've got and just being that bit crisper so we don't lose it as uh, we go on through the demonstration putting the paint on. Yeah. Now this uh, tree here I think we can make that a little more substantial. I like the shape that we have. So so we can have that going across there. Okay, now this branch actually, um, it's higher in the air than I'm showing it in the uh, canvas, but it sweeps across and you see the shape being very open here, leaves quite a big sort of gap in the middle of my picture. So I'm taking the branch that I can see above me and I'm including it in the picture. 
And you see how that then holds the shape. So now this shape here becomes a, a hand holding the shape, the, the, the view together. And I can subdivide that with the um, sycamore tree that's in behind. This, I think, can move slightly over this way. Do you see it makes a slightly tighter shape? So um, we've been studying um, as we've been studying Cezanne uh, over the last uh, little while in our live stream classes, and um, it's very interesting doing that because you get to see how these little tiny adjustments of the negative spaces really make the difference in a master's painting. So, sure, we may as well try and, uh, and, and learn from that. So if you want to look those up, um, you go to the website irishschooloflandscapepainting.com and you look on the live stream page and uh, you'll see um, uh, various options there. To find this uh, demonstration, you can go to the live stream page and then go to my collection, again on Irish School Landscape Painting, um, and it will show up there or you go to the videos page and it'll show, it'll show up there. Okay, so that's the lower branch of the um, sycamore. And then these are the stones coming across. The, the, the path goes across here and we have um, the bank, the green bank coming across here which then comes in here and around here. This is where the water comes when the um, river floods. Okay, I think that's probably enough to start painting. Hmm. We might just divide up the shape back here a little bit because um, because that, that's a little bit blank. And I think we want to have the um, foliage, the shape of the foliage onto this. So with the shape of the foliage on there, I'm gonna move this bit of foliage in the background up a bit, again, to make the nice negative shapes flowing through the composition. And, um, Hmm. Maybe we'll have another tree coming back in here, just to divide that up a bit more. For the background as it goes through. So what this means is that I, when I start painting, I don't need to be thinking of shapes. So all I have to think of at the painting stage is applying the paint. All I have to do at the uh, drawing stage is think of shapes. And it means that each, each, each um, stage has its own, um, own task. So we've got some rather nice shapes coming across here. And we've got a rather nice shape here of holly coming in, which might be quite nice to have as a dark shape. So just working from the big shapes down to the small shapes. <coughs> got some rather nice stones over here.
So that will link the eye around to the, uh, around to the riverbed. And the riverbed itself has um, some nice arrangements of stones. lead the eye through. Oh, an easier way perhaps for you to, to fi um, find the other videos which um, link in with this is to follow our, on, the, um, on the YouTube page there's a, um, a link that you can click on. I'm not a computer person but um, you'll find links that you can click on. If not, irishschoolaflandscapepainting.com Now, on we go to the painting stage. So this is stage one. Select and draw in your composition is complete. Now we're going to go on to um, painting. So we have uh, the palette camera and um, this is uh, acrylic paint with acrylic medium. This is acrylic medium. And what we're going to do is we're going to mix up with a little bit of medium, quite a bit of elbow grease. Now you see that, that color that I just used, yellow ochre, that happens to be one that's been in storage for a little bit longer than, um, uh, say, that one, which is cadmium yellow. And so this one is a little bit stiffer. So all you do to use that is you just mix it a little longer with a little bit more elbow grease. And um, there you go. Now, there's my palette knife for my um, ochre colours, yellowy colours and here's my palette knife for my bluey colours. So if you, uh, if you like to note, um, I'm using two different palettes for two different sets of colours. So here we have um, Monestial Blue, uh, which, is, uh, which is called Thalo Blue in um, the Windsor and Newton range. And this is ultramarine blue. So this is a cold blue, the um, phthalo blue. And this is a warm blue. And this is a blue that's halfway in between and it's called cobalt blue. So mix them all up a bit with the, um, with the white. Now, in some ways, uh, we're lucky that it's not too sunny. It's a shame for the... Um, for seeing the light coming through, but on the other hand, it means the paint stays lovely and creamy and doesn't take any effort to look after. Now, I'm going to start by blocking in and I'm going to block in the sky first. The reason for blocking in the sky first is because um, then I won't have these little um, holes that I have to fill in later. So I'm just putting in a bit of blue as a background. Now, even though it's quite late in the day now and uh, it's uh, not bright and sunny, I'm going to make this picture into a bright and sunny picture. So what I'm doing is I'm holding in my mind the view that I saw that gave me the inspiration to want to paint this view. So um, it was just after a, a night of thunderstorms and I came down to walk in the woods and there was this fallen tree and the light was just superb on it, dancing across it. Now, uh, it's taken us a little while to get down here with the cameras because um, our Tuesday um, regular live streams kind of take priority. So it took a little while to get the combination of good weather and um, 
and, and uh, camera space to be able to come down to do this. But I really wanted to do it before um, the view disappeared. So as time passes by, um, the um, fallen bit of tree is, is sinking more and more into the uh, uh, river there. Um, and becoming less and less dominant. So I'm going to remember it the way it was the first day that I saw it, the effect that it had on me the first day that I saw it. Now into here I've added a bit of prism, prism violet, might even add a little bit of, of brown. Because I, I, as you look at the water there, do you see it's not actually terribly blue? Like it will be a little bluer when we have sun in the sky, um, sunshine in the sky. But the characteristic of this river, um, as it runs down off the mountain and uh, along here to Ashford, is that it, it's, quite, um, it's quite brown from the bog water that comes off the mountain. But nevertheless, um, it does uh, shine um, with a reflection of a blue sky when the sun comes out. So that's uh, my original white and monestial blue and ultramarine blue with a bit of purple and a bit of brown all, all put together. And you see in the palette how clean it is. So I've got what I've done is I've, I've used the medium to mix the blues, pummel them around with the, um, with the medium so it's nice and creamy and then into that creamy mix I can add my other colours and uh, it, uh, it works nicely for me. Now I'm taking a little bit of my yellow ochre and white mix and a bit of brown, I didn't really mean to get that bit of green but I don't, I don't mind it too much for um, the path here. No. The green wasn't really meant to go into that. But. So, this is, so what I'm doing is I'm establishing my different areas, the main areas. So this is where the river rushes through when it's in flood, which it's a long way from being. And uh, there's a bit of ochre and a bit of brown. And I'm just blocking in quite simply. So um, the paint here is a little bit thin, which gives me the ability to just establish these shapes. And so I'm, I'm talking to you at the same time, it's taking a little bit of, little bit of concentration. But it's not actually thinned with water, it's thinned with this um, medium, which gives it a little bit more substance. So I'm just going to mark in back here because, as I remember, um, that's where the light will be coming. And just like having the blue coming through the sky, this allows me to have a little bit of warmth coming through the trees. Now you see why I wanted my easel nice and firm. Um, th there's a fair amount of, of um, vim and vigour going into that. Now I've added a little bit of um, permanent green, permanent green light, just so that I can start establishing these areas of foliage. Now a little bit of lemon in with the permanent green light.
So I remember I've got light coming across this area. Now this area in the back, it's obviously going to be uh, less warm. So I'm taking a little bit of ochre and I'm using a little bit of the cobalt, uh, the, it's pris prism violet, a little bit of the violet in with it. because I think, well, my, I know my light is going to come from the left because that's what I saw. And I think that the light will shine through here in the background. Now, I know that I'm going to have a bit of purple coming through the, the stones here. Um, so I'm going to use a, a bit of purple with uh, yellow ochre and white and a bit of brown. It's even got a little bit of that green in it. But you can see in the palette there how I'm mixing it all with one brush. Because these stones are quite purpley. And uh, there are lighter ones and there are darker ones. So a little bit more ochre and white in with these lighter ones. So um, this, this stage we call blocking in, and again you can see more about this on the videos page or on the live stream page, Irish School of Landscape Painting, and it will show you the same blocking in uh, method on a number of different um, paintings in a number of different media. So I use the same basic approach to painting, whether it's in oils or watercolors or acrylics, um, uh, it, it's really a mental approach to, to your painting. Again, um, it's a sort of scientific way of breaking up this business which can be quite complicated. So it allows for moments of inspiration, but it also, also allows for those times when you're um, not feeling quite so inspired um, to have a technique that you can fall back on yourself without, without needing to go, you know, um, to rely on someone else to to feed back to you what what should be done next you can always have a scientific method for um, figuring it out yourself so now this is a little bit of blue in with the um, purple because this part i want to fade a little bit more into the background so i have it less strong i have it less warm um, warm colors come forward cold colors go back you see that I'm using slightly thicker paint now. I'm using more of my creamy paint because I, I don't want um, the background to, to show through this now. And I can establish a few of my, uh, my rocks in here um, quickly. So you can draw with line, you can draw with um, um, shapes of tone. Now I think I want to get in these, these big trees. So you see how this is building up very logically, one bit after another. Um, first, first things first, major parts first. So this is um, dioxine uh, purple and um, brown and a bit of white. So this is my tree in the background. So you see how dark it is underneath. Now I, I may bring some more brown green over that afterwards. But um, the purple is quite an easy colour to work with because if I make a mistake with it, I can um, merge it into the background. And meantime, it establishes this basic dark tone that I want for this, uh, for this tree. It's the, it's the whole purpose of the, um, of the pitch of this tree. This is the main, this is the bit of detail that I really liked with the light bouncing off it. But this is the main thrust. Look, look at what, look at what a strong shape that is. It has to be painted in a strong way. Now, I could use ochre. This happens to be gold and yellow um, with a bit of brown and a bit of purple. Um, and this is for the tree that goes over the top. Now you see how that 
um, is distinctly lighter in real life and by using it um, just after I've got the dark on the brush um, it gives me some of those dark lines that help to give me the thrust of it falling over and leaning on, the, on this tree. And the little bit of detail, so you see it's um, broken up here, it's a completely broken bit and then it goes around and gets darker back there. I'm going to use a smaller brush for that, um, but partly because it's a darker tone and, and I don't want to um, clean off this brush till I finish getting the feel of this tree in. So you see those lines from having quite a heavily laden brush actually give a feeling of, of, of the, the bark as it goes up the tree. Now then we have um, the second, second part of this. So this tree and this tree um, belong to the same root system. This purple tree is actually behind it geographically. So um, I want to make this uh, branch make sure that it, it allies itself by the colours I've chosen for the bark to this tree because it's a part of the same tree whereas that purple one is a different is actually a different tree. So this is the tree here it goes all the way up into the into the sky up there and I've condensed it into the one area. So. so being careful to get the thrust. Now I want it to be a little bit darker as it goes up against this, uh, up, up high because as, as I visually sit here and look up high I'm looking up against the light and it looks darker. So by making it darker up on the top here it brings it, um, it brings the picture, it makes the picture, um, holds the picture. So now as I was talking I kind of lost my line there but no worries this is acrylic this is the advantage of acrylic I'm just going to take a bit of tissue and I'm going to uh, damp it and then just remove the bit of paint I don't want. Acrylic is very forgiving. Now uh, you, you see how the, how the exact shape of that is is important. So um, as I mentioned this is what we've been studying by studying some of the old masters and Suzanne in particular we were looking at shape and um, because he's he's the uh, father of, of all modern painting really um, and while we were studying that we saw how how important making those slight changes little slight changes to the shape re really are really makes a difference. Now we have this purple um, thrusting tree, so back to the dioxine purple, a little bit more on the brush, and this break, you see there's a gap between this break and um, where the second uh, bit branches off, and although that's not exactly what I drew, I'm correcting that now. So forgive my corrections what I should do as an artist is after finishing my drawing is to get up stand back see it from a distance so that I can really judge it I didn't do that because it's a demonstration and, and uh, you don't want to be sitting there forever watching me so um, so I shortcut it so. so this system of ours this uh, four stage system um, provides fail safe so if you forget or skip on some of the stages uh, you'll be able to catch up with it again um, later. Now <coughs> we have a, a whitish tree there but before I put in that whitish tree I think I'm going to put in this um, um, sycamore back here because it's more or less the same colour. It's greenier, it probably should be a little bit lighter than I've just put it in but I can adjust that tone later. I'm just making sure that I get 
that I uh, <laughs> that I don't lose si sight of uh, what I've drawn and which tree belongs to which tree. So this is the sycamore here. And I want to get the characteristic of, of how, how these smaller branches drape in here to support. Now, I know that's a little bit too thick, but I can thin that down as I'm painting the foliage. But to get the feel of the drape is really important. Now, there is a line of foliage. I shall have to work that out afterwards that comes across here. And that makes a really nice movement through the back as well. Now, back to filling in um, uh, these bits. So let's just take that right out of the page and take this right out of the canvas too, even if I do it a bit thick because I can cover it over. Uh, because this, these are the, it's like a, making um, a stained glass window, isn't it? I, I want to get all these um, structures in the woods clear um, because because um, these shapes they really make they're going to hold the composition it's important to have them um, right now this one here is going to be much uh, bluer and, and whiter so a little bit of blue bit of blue I still haven't cleaned my brush I'm just using these colors one on top of another um, if you're more comfortable cleaning your brush, go ahead. There's no reason not to. I'm only trying to do this um, quickly so that you can all see. It's also useful to be able to work quickly because there'll be times when you're outside and, and you're kind of at the mercy of the weather. And you don't want to be like Suzanne and get caught in a rain shower and get pneumonia from it. There's more than one landscape artist that have, have gone that way. Okay, now, these ones back here, um, the further back, they can be a little bit more ochre. So a little bit of ochre with green. Um, and we'll just put in these trees back here. Yeah, that one comes over that horizontal one. And I think we'll just, we'll just mark these lines in when I do the foliage, if I don't want them, I can move them. Yeah, there's another flowing branch back here. Okay, now we have these trees over on the left-hand side that we need to get in. So I'm making sure that each one is slightly different in tone and colour just gives variety and if you look into the branches and trunks of trees you'll see that um, not only are they all different but each species has its own characteristic bark characteristic color now we might even bring some of this down here because there are a lot of roots there showing so in fact there's a bit of soil here and then the bit that's normally under water is all purpley twisty roots going down into the water and again that's gone slightly over the line so I'm just going to lift it so the blue has uh, the blue paint has, has dried a bit there 
Now we want to get in some of the dark shapes which are back here. So now we're going to a colder green. So this is Viridian green with a bit of blue, a bit of purple. And there's some very dark shapes back here. But before I do that, I got to put in, I'm going to take another brush and put in these, uh, these small branch shapes because uh, I guess I'm dithering about them a bit because they're so important to the picture and I haven't had a chance to stand back and look at them. So it makes me a bit nervous about putting them in. So never mind. Now we want to get this lovely dark twist. So. Yep, just looking at the shape, making sure it's what I want. Now, there's a number of smaller branches um, branching off from that, which I'm not going to put in for the moment, but I am going to put in this one, which will support the foliage, and it shows me the shape that I want there. So that I don't lose that as I'm blocking it. That is important. Now we have another um, branch coming up from here which belongs to this tree so it's got to be in the colours of this tree. So this is slightly browner, browner, greener, oak, more oakery and it twists its way around all the way up to here. So to make this go thicker as I come down I'm just leaning more heavily on my brush. These trees, they, I think it, most unusually, um, they were pollarded, I think, or coppiced or something like that. Because they're all growing out of one um, um, base. Now then, the temptation, oh, there's a rather nice branch here too. and stones coming out into the water. So that's uh, the dioxine purple and green and brown. So some of these are very dark, but really I shouldn't be getting into small shapes here. I should be concentrating on getting the big shapes in, but it's very easy to get sidetracked. Now you don't want to leave your your brushes sitting with paint on so I've just cleaned off the paint off the smaller brush and we're back to us our bigger brush. And welcome back. Oh wow, was that a good coffee break? Well timed. 
So here we go again. Um, now we've got um, the light shapes blocked in, we've got the main structure of the composition blocked in. So the next thing, obviously, will be to put in the dark shapes. So here we go. So this is, uh, well, dark and cold. So this is um, thallow green, viridian green, cold green. Um, mm, what will I put with it? Uh, let's just see how it looks on the canvas because it's, it's getting quite dark here. Uh, but that is really quite dark. Now, I know that I'm going to want to put in my um, a bit of fallen branch very soon with a um, feature of the leaves. So if the leaves are going to be a feature, that's where my hit sun is going to hit onto the, um, onto the leaves. Uh, so if I know my leaves are going to be light because they're going to be a feature in the picture, therefore I need to have dark behind. So it's just a logical process. So I'm using a little bit of the blue and white, a little bit of the purple, a um, little bit of the cobalt blue uh, and white there, just so it's not quite as densely dark. Um, but good and dark. <clears throat> I've moved to a slightly smaller brush. It's a hog brush this time instead of um, uh, a nylon one. Now I'm using a little bit of the emerald green so it's not quite as dark. A little bit of the cobalt violet. So as, as we go we are changing the colours slightly just to make a little bit of variety. As we move further up I'm going to use a little bit of the permanent green light in with it. There's a little bit of variety. Not being particularly careful about my edges because, um, because this isn't the finished product. This is blocking in on the site. So it's far more important to me to get the um, major movements of light and dark through the picture than it is to worry ab about whether my edges is, uh, is nice. Nice sap green. Do I have sap green out? Yes. That, no, that's hooker's green. Huh, meant to put it out and I didn't put it out. Okay, um, so I'll use the hooker's green. Mm, it's a little bit dark. Donovan, would you mind squeezing out a little bit of uh, sap green for me? It'll be in the green boxes which are over there or underneath the blues. It was getting near the end of the tube, so I, uh, I didn't do it. So sap green is a more neutral kind of green. It's very useful for mixing. It would be the basic green that I would use. If I, if, if I couldn't have any other greens and I had to choose one, it, it would green? be sap green, yes. So this is olive green, which is, which is a briny green, which is also a, a useful one. But as you can see, it's quite briny. Now, if I were if I were concerned about the, um, um, do you want it? Uh, where do I want it? Good question. Um, there, please. Good, good dollop of it. Okay. If you're again, if you're concerned about your, your losing your drawing uh, because you've got your green overlapping some of the twigs and things, just take a damp tissue and run it over. And if the paint is dry behind, then um, uh, then it will come off. the bit you want will come off instead of all of it. So as I'm working with the brush, obviously the bit that I've just put on the um, brush is on the tip and the chunk of paint um, uh, at the at, uh, nearer the ferrule is this colour. So it's bluey green there, it's brine, browny green, which is the olive green on the tip of the brush. That's all that's left. Yes, that's what I thought. There is another tube actually. I can uh, find it in the green. Uh, there's, there's two boxes of greens. Okay. So. So now this is um, holly coming in here. I might need to put some more cold in with that but uh, at least I get the tone in because the light is definitely tending to go now. 
And as I say, there's rain forecast, so. Can't find the sapphire. Oh well, never mind, I work with what I've got. So he, he says he can't find the sap green, not to worry. So that's a bit of permanent green light instead. Now, uh, the little bit of sap that I have with a bit of yellow ochre and white. I'm going to go get light in the house. Okay. With sap there. Okay. So that's a little bit of ochre and lemon going in, just so that we have a bit of difference there, so I don't, I don't lose the difference in the planes. Now it really is starting to get um, dark, I'm going to have to speed on with this, so um, I'm just going to quickly get in some of the darker foliage here. Here it comes. He can stay if he wants to, Donovan. Just tie. He, to uh, he wants to go with you? Okay. So this is a bit of lemon, more lemon and ochre, so you can see I'm getting slightly lighter as I come over here. Again, um, trying to keep with the character of the um, uh, the brush strokes. So you can see how the canopies of, of leaves sweep across in particular shapes. So um, I'm trying to capture the shape of the canopy. There's always a, a, a swoop. Um, I'm aware that everything's getting a little dark. That's because the light is going. So in a moment I'm going to have to sit back and uh, engage my memory of how the light was when the light was here because I don't want it to turn into a completely dark picture. At the same time, I want to use what I can see because the experience of being here on the site is entirely different from being in the studio, particularly if you're painting the woodland because the woodland is so full of bits of details, twigs, branches, leaves that you're not going to put in because if you were put in every single bit of detail, in the twigs, branches and leaves, then you're going to have to put in every blade of grass and every stone in the front and um, you'll be forever painting your picture and will quite likely get lost in the detail. So it's better really, I think, to um, go for your main shapes. So even the Impressionists, we're going to work um, next in, in our Tuesday live stream um, once we finish in the garden, which we're doing at the moment. Uh, we're doing wildflowers in the garden. Um, so once we finish with that, we're going to go on to Pizarro, who, whilst he isn't the, the best known of the Impressionists, he was um, um, kind of the father of the Impressionists. He was the kindly older gentleman that um, uh, the young ones would go to um, for a bit of training. Um, Cezanne worked with him, Gauguin worked with him, um, Monet worked with him. Uh, he and Monet together kind of discovered discovered snow painting, for instance, painting in the winter, the delights of the snow. They painted many alongside one another. Um, but we're going to we're going to study Pizarro because we've done uh, Monet and uh, we wanted there was a request to go back to Impressionism. And uh, Pizarro would always work on the site if he had any choice at all about it. And when he got older and he couldn't, um, he had some trouble with his eyes and couldn't work on the site anymore, he would hire hotel rooms um, with uh, views. So he, and then he would do series of paintings from there. In fact, he would do like, like a triptych. Um, uh, so it'd be three different canvases from from slightly different angles, and if you lined the three canvases up all together, it would make a panorama, all from the hotel bedroom. Um, so there'd be views across the docks, or views across um, 
big big avenues in, in Paris. Um, but he would always work, if at all pos possible, on the site. And the reason that he would do that was because you get something completely different. And even though his pictures would be very detailed, particularly his pointillist period, he went and worked for a while with Georges Seurat. So even though um, he um, trained many people, when he decided to experiment with pointillism, he went to Seurat and, um, and worked with him for a while and, and faithfully applied the um, pointillist technique. He was always very um, uh, diligent in what he did. So when he did the impressionist technique, he was um, absolutely careful and precise in doing that. Um, and he was the most diligent of all of the um, impressionists in that um, he was the, the one that, that, that um, started the exhibitions, that the impressionist exhibitions. He exhibited, the only one who exhibited in all eight impressionist exhibitions even though he's not the best known of the Impressionists or the, the most well regarded in, in, in many spheres. Um, but he was diligent in his application. So his, um, uh, particularly his pointillist ones, but his Impressionist ones as well, would be very finely detailed. Um, so the pointillist is, is painting pictures with a series of coloured dots. So you couldn't get much more um, detailed than that. But he would start on the site and he would always advise his students to begin with the big areas and uh, to um, not get fine dine with detail and to work up the whole canvas together. So exactly what we're doing here. So as I explained, we were going to um, be aware of uh, this lovely um, shape here. I'm not too sure if I want it to expand that side we'll see I'll, I'll block in the rest of it but this has to be light this shape of um, of the fallen tree and whilst I'm using f small strokes and I'm varying the color that I'm using as I, as I put on so I'm adding a bit of um, olive green or a bit of lemon yellow or a bit of transparent yellow or um, a bit of sap green what I'm doing is I'm looking at the contrast, or even here a little bit of the um, um, permanent green. Although, if that's going to be dead leaves, I think I might. Uh, surprisingly enough, the, the leaves haven't all died off. You know, a, a, a tree sometimes seems to be able to sustain a broken limb for a while. Um, but we don't want we don't want the the colour to be too vibrant. We want it to be bright, but not particularly vibrant. And you remember that shape that I drew for it in the beginning. I'm I'm um, holding that on my head, and keeping the smaller strokes that I'm uh, placing on for the different parts of the um, fallen tree. Uh, I'm keeping that overall shape in my head so that uh, it, it forms a, a strong bond with the shapes which are around. Now, a little bit of golden yellow coming in here because some of those underneath leaves have died off a little bit. And it's an excuse to have another warm colour, a bit of variety as it comes down. Now it's a, a little bit darker in underneath. That's a bit more sap green. Now if I'm going to have dark underneath in the um, foliage, then I'm going to have to have dark on the um, stones underneath. So just rinsing off that brush, uh, just quickly, it's still going to have a little bit of a green tinge about it, but not as much. So I've put a little bit of purple in with um, some of the bluey grey or briny bluey grey to make shadow underneath. So it's plain that that is sitting into the ground. Now I'm losing a little bit of the shape of the stones there so a little bit thicker paint 
um, with the uh, warmer stones and just pick them up again over the top return my shape and then we've got stones which um, extend a little bit further back here see how far up the water comes so um, I'm gonna have to have stones back here But of course, there's also a twist to a grassy bank that comes around. Now we want um, some more for uh, clean that off. Just dry off the brush a little bit with a tissue because uh, we don't really want the paint to be thinned down um, now Oop. slightly lighter green so there in the distance we have a slightly bluey slightly lighter green just to neaten up those edges and give us some distance to walk into. So th this is cold because I'm going to have yellow light leaves coming across and it's slightly bluer, slightly um, less intense color, I'd say grayer, but that might be confusing, so that it goes away into the distance. Now, Obviously, I'm going to have light coming across here and I'm going to have half tones coming up there. So let's get in the light in the front here because that will be slightly stronger. So this is lemon with um, uh, permanent green, permanent green light and, the, and a bit of transparent yellow. So this gives a nice green bank. So it's warm sits into the front and a little bit more warmth with a bit of cadmium yellow coming over here I don't know what you call these reedy things but there's some striking reeds here which are quite warm it's a sort of reedy grass I might just give a few flicks up like that so that I remember it's the reedy grass when I come to do the detail. So I'm not doing any detail on this at all. I'm merely establishing the local tone and color for each area. And this will help me um, to be able to get a feeling of distance into the painting because each area sits into its own plane so we have the forward plane we have the middle plane we have the background plane and and this makes it easier to see where these trees sit now in doing that I slightly lost the bottom of that tree so I'm just going to take a second brush and make sure that it comes all the way down is quite dark at the bottom anyway where the um, floods often get it it gets really dark put that in water just so that it doesn't go bad now um, as we come across the front here um, it's very low uh, bits of, of, of low growing uh, foliage grass plants don't know quite what you want to describe them as but they're quite different in character so I'm using a horizontal stroke here I'm using ochery olivey browny um, greens so you get these low growing plants in amongst the stones which are going to be here so it's it doesn't confuse or take the eye away from uh, what's behind there
So mossy green sap with a little bit of um, uh, viridian there. Now, I took coffee break, I didn't mention to you, but I took coffee break as I started to get too involved with um, uh, detail. You don't want to, uh, it's, it's ever so tempting when you're on the site, but you don't really want to get too involved with the detail. Now, we don't have any um, sunshine as in direct sunshine to look at here, but I do know that I'm planning my light to come from the left. So I'm going to put a, a shadow across the um, path here so that both so I remember it, but also do you see how, how interesting that shape is? see it adds to the composition and uh, as it hits the bank of, of reeds there um, obviously it will go um, and follow the plane that it's traveling across so a shadow isn't straight flat on the ground it's only flat if the ground is flat if you have a building in the way it goes up the building if you have a stone in the way it goes up the stone and, and if you have um, um, a bank of reeds it goes up the bank of reeds now, here we go. Um, we forgot on the bank here to put in this bit, which would be the lightest part. So this bit really facing into the light can have a little bit more lemon in it. Lemon with um, transparent jello. Hello, hello, Zef, the dog's coming to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we want to uh, block in just the uh, foliage at the top here. Uh, we made quite a nice pattern when we um, um, first saw it, so I'm, I'm going to try and keep to the pattern. Um, so I'm using lemon and a permanent green light and a bit of, a little bit of the golden yellow, so it's not quite so bright little bit of the transparent yellow and um, here we go oh my goodness so uh, Donovan went and fetched some more lights so um, hopefully you're gonna have a slightly better light to see oh <laughs> that's a little a little confusing as he changes it with spotlights but uh, oh, just to he's just trying to position it so uh, we'll settle down in a moment So I hope the lack of light hasn't been a, a disturbance to you. Um, we will at some point get back down here um, on a sunny day, but we just don't quite know when the sun is going to come. Uh, so we're doing this while we still have that, that lovely scene intact. Oh, wow. Does that make a difference? <laughs> So however difficult this might be painting in um, not ideal bright sunny weather, can you imagine what it was like for Monet and Pizarro painting in the snow? They were staying together um, and there was this great big snowstorm. And um, so they both went to opposite ends of the street and painted over a few days quite a few pictures of the um, uh, the, road to fun, uh, the road to Versailles. So it's quite interesting to um, look that up if you like. So over his um, uh, painting life, he, um, he painted a hundred uh, different views of, the, of winter scenes, not, not all um, snow, but but um, snow or hoar frost or um, ice, um, some real distinct wintry. Is that a good brightness? 
Uh, yes, except my palette. Uh, it's a good. He asks, is it a good brightness? Yes, except my palette is is uh, going to be very dark for everyone. I could turn up this light if you want. Um, I'll have a palette light in a second. Oh, you'll have a palette light in a second. No, this is fine. So it's a it's a it's a very logical progression from um, from drawing through blocking um, and then eventually through to chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro being the uh, modelling of it, uh, bringing um, the sunshine through it, which plainly we're not going to do today. Um, but if you go look at at the website um, www.irishschooloflandscapepainting.com or follow the link at the bottom of the page or side of the page, wherever it is, um, then you will find on the videos page um, samples of um, this uh, blocking and um, um, four stage method uh, in oils and watercolors, in um, acrylics, in palette knife, in brushwork. Um, anyway, uh, go to the site, explore it. If you have any questions, you can always write to me at susan at irishschooloflandscapepainting.com. Happy to help with any questions. And, um, uh, you know, go out in the landscape and uh, try this. It's, uh, it's, it's really a, a nourishing thing to do. And it is definitely easier on the site. At least you get something that's quite different on the site than you do um, uh, in, um, in the studio. Now, uh, uh, Donovan, that's uh, lovely, I'm sure, for the cameras, but I actually can't see the scene um, when I'm looking through lights. So you want me to turn the palette down? Well, uh, either that or I can sort of do it from memory. Oh, yes, if you can turn, that's much better. Is this okay? Uh, no, because wherever I look at the light, I can't see the scene. Um, but we could continue, if you like, with uh, without the palette light. You want to do it without the well, palette light? If, if, if this is okay, that's fine. Oh yes, if you do it from yes, that's better. Uh, for, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. So memory is a wonderful thing. Um, you see, if I were doing this from a photograph, the photograph would have picked up all the fine bits of detail, but having to do this from memory makes me really engage with the scene and really um, see how the light um, moves through the composition. Because to some degree, I'm having to make up from my memory the um, movement of this light. So I'm definitely gonna make it all tie together because I'm not looking to copy, uh, uh, looking at a photograph and copying this bit and then this bit and then this bit without engaging my brain and just following bits of detail. So however tricky your um, circumstances on site, you do, you do get a benefit from it. When we have um, classes out on site um, and it's raining or um, um, spotting rain or um, showers that we have to go from the um, from the cars out onto the site and then back to the cars you know any kind of difficult circumstance like that Do you know I often find that people get their best pictures because um, what happens is they have to concentrate so the bit of time that they have uh, w with the painting um, they're really engaged with it instead of you know, just enjoying the sunshine and, um, you know, looking at what their neighbour's doing and uh, all those things that can distract you when you're out on site. So anyway, it's a different way. Now, I'm just uh, to save time from cleaning those brushes, I'm taking some fresh brushes. So I'm moving now to smaller shapes. So it's, it, it's the same process, it's just smaller and smaller shapes. So just as, I, as I've brought the sunshine, whoop, 
I've brought the sunshine through the picture. Now I, I can bring a bit of uh, shadow through the picture. And actually, just as my brush almost touched that, those, those reeds actually go very high. Now then, we want to get a bit more um, uh, light through the front. So um, the, the little bit of extra light I'm going to put on is going to um, uh, describe the landscape a little bit. So we're going to have um, bits of stronger ochre where the, um, the path is picked up. We're going to have bits of stronger um, brown and purple where the path is um, has got dips in it. Um, as I'm making these stronger passages, I'm, I'm looking at the landscape, which is so incredibly varied, and making them sympathetic to the, to the movement in the landscape. So this, this um, bit where the river runs is somewhat hollowed out from the way that they, the water runs through it. And so it makes this, um, uh, that's very good, Donovan. Uh, it, that makes this very uh, um, interesting pattern. And you see how that makes a sort of swirl. You can feel the swirl go through the landscape, which is, which is very nice. Now, plainly at the moment, it's not going to be possible really to see the, the patterns in the water, but we can um, know that we're going to make it darker there. and bring in a little bit of this muddy soil. Because this carries the movement through to the water, which uh, you can see um, is also carried through by the shapes of the stones, the movement of the, of the lots of little stones which go through there. So this nye is um, somewhat modulating. Um, that's a term that that Suzanne would use a lot, uh, modulations of colour and tone. So instead of having the, the, the straight blue, now maybe I'm being influenced by what's around me at the moment as, as the blueness um, disappears in the water, but also it's setting the scene for this particular um, painting, which is plainly influenced by being on the site, which is why we're on the site. So whatever the reason for it, I'm enjoying it. It is fun. So here, um, a little bit of, of, of greeny purples coming in. So these are the, the, the stones which are heading down into the water. A little bit darker here, a little bit lighter there. Yes. It's getting very dark. Yes, Donovan, Donovan thinks that perhaps painting in the dark is a little extreme. <laughs> well, you're the one seeing the picture, Donovan. If you're happy that I've done enough, I'm happy. Because we, um, we're plainly not going to get here in the next few days with the rain. You're the boss. Ten minutes. I am merely painting. So, ten minutes. So. Um, I'm just continuing to make smaller and smaller shapes. So now I'm describing the movement of the land through, um, um, through the path. Now, I, I guess you probably can't see as much as I can um, through the cameras, the limitation of the cameras, but um, I, I still am copying what I can see. Now, this is the feeling of the um, beech leaves. So it's the canopy of beech leaves as it comes across here. So it makes an arch that you're um, traveling through. To go to the further part of the wood. 
So for those that have been um, following the series that, that know this part of the world, County Wickler, um, the, the, the land here is just upstream from um, Mount Usher Gardens, about a, a mile upstream. And this is just a bit further downstream than um, the last demonstration, um, which was a bit nearer to Nuns Cross. Now, you see how that arch then moves through? Now we're going to get light foliage that will go across that um, because we don't want it tying too much to the background. Now then, oh that's very good Donovan, leave it at that because uh, I can see the, I, I, I'm starting not to be able to see the foliage I was painting. Okay, so I'll just bring some, oh no, don't change it. Um, see your eyes adjust when um, when they don't have bright lights coming across. So, um, so this is the I remember the shapes that I drew in um, f uh, across here. So on the top of. Of these, yeah. Remember the shape of the outline of the foliage. So we're still just being systematic. The um, tones that I'm using are varying more and more towards what we call half tones because they're halfway in between light and dark. So, so as it's light, it, 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 um, but in the background, it's less strong light than it is in the foreground, and that gives us the feeling of distance. Okay, so now we, we're going to have a strong light onto this tree here, because I remember it being strong. And then you'll see why in a minute because it will tie the eye. See, there's a, there's a, a really strong um, texture on this tree. So I'm using thicker paint on top. So we've been exploring textures a lot with um, the last garden stream, which we just finished. We did a whole lot of different textures, which is the, the use of acrylic. So this is a, this is a texture. Um, so it's using thicker paint, a little bit of medium, no water. And you see how um, effectively that describes the um, trunk. Now, as it comes at, at down towards the darker bit, um, we just introduce some browns and, and purples. So now that we've got the light coming down here, we can pick up a, a, um, a trunk uh, um, root or two. Um, just see, then it, it comes around, you move it around, and it will come through here and pick up on various stones. So a little bit of lemon and a little bit of ochre. One day we'll do a moonlight stream. That would be really fun. Yes, Donovan? Under a full moon. In the middle of the woods. That would be fun. So now I'm bringing um, a slightly less strong light, but for the light hitting onto the um, uh, beach or the rocks, which carries the light then from the, the um, main feature of the um, fallen branch across. You see, obviously, this tree is going through three-dimensional space, so it's traveling further away from us. That's why the fallen bit is in the ground back there, and the root is here. And, and that's a part of the, the drama of the scene, so it has a really strong perspective, so it needs, a really, strong, it needs really strong shapes in it. Um, so I hope that makes sense.
So now we can um, do the same, but with the darker shapes. So a bit of ochre in with the purpley brown. And now this is just called dry brush, where I just drag it across the canvas and it just catches on some of the um, areas. Now, it's a very funny thing about tone. Do you see here? Do you see how that seems to be dark? Because it's against the white background. Exactly the same colour on the brush and I, I drag it across what's already dark and it looks light. Okay, and then I drag it again against the light and it looks dark again. And that's because you're looking at contrast. So, um, yeah, anyway. Fascinating things about paint. I find them fascinating. Now, I'm going to take a, a slightly um, bluey grey. So that's a contrast. And we'll get some um, colder stones. So now we've got the contrast of warm against cold. Another contrast. All adds interest. Um, now we can go back to the light again and we can pick up a little bit of light on the water. Which then can pull, uh, you know, ease your eye back to uh, the light on the um, stones. So you see the light on the water here, it doesn't come out too far in this direction. So that when you go up another level and there's another bit of light, it goes a bit further. The, 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 the lights don't stop one at, um, in a, a vertical line above one another. It makes more interest. So what happens is your eye goes up these bits of light here, up here across to here and then it gets taken up through the picture and then around the light on this it keeps it keeps being pulled and then around to the lights over here and then back down um, your light trunk and so what what you're doing is you're pulling your eye into the picture and making the eye circulate around the picture so that the eye can keep finding um, something interesting what i like what i i like about paintings is the picture the pictures that that, that slowly pull